as you know, in this talk, we will be learning, among other things, about the queer archives in Toronto. I learned about them from some alumni I met during an in-person event we held in the before times in Toronto. Uh, it was an event celebrating McMaster's archives. It was a few years ago. I'd never heard of the queer archives and I was blown away by what they told me about the scope and scale of the collections. And ever since then, I have wanted to bring an event to our McMaster alumni about them. So I am thrilled to be learning more about these archives today along with you. A little bit about our speakers. Uh, Dr. Craig Jennix is an assess assistant professor at Ryerson University in the Faculty of Arts. He is a scholar interested in queer culture and politics, queer and feminist theory and popular music. He has a PhD in gender studies and feminist research and a master's in cultural studies and critical theory, both from Mac and a BA in music from Dalhousie. He has previously taught at Mac, where he won the McMaster Student Union Excellence in Teaching Award. Nisha Eswaran is a PhD candidate, almost done, in McMaster's English and Cultural <laughs> Studies Department. And her area of research is friendship and anti-colonial history in South Asian literature. Together, they co-authored the book we'll be hearing about today, Out North, An Archive of Queer Activism and Kinship in Canada. Welcome to you both. Thank you, Chris. It's such a thank an, you. Yeah, it's so Thanks nice to be us. here to chat with you about this this book project that Nisha and I have been working on for the last few years. Um, so, what Nisha and I thought we might do today that might be useful for for everyone involved is we might spend a bit of time talking about the archive from which this book comes. And so, this entire book comes out of the collections at the archives, spelled with a Q, um, in Toronto. It's Canada's LGBTQ2 plus archive. It was previously named the Canadian Lesbian and Gay Archives, and before that the Canadian Gay Archives, which I think shows us the way that terminology shifts and the way that we sort of reassess our thinking about gender and sexuality, depending on the cultural and historical moment. But what we thought we would do is maybe offer you a bit of a virtual tour through that physical space at the archives, and then we can hinge and shift to speaking a little bit about the book Out North. Um, which Nish and I uh, spent about three years on, I think, in total, uh, before it was published um, within the last 10 months. Um, so it's a relatively new publication, and we're keen to talk about that. And then, we'll, so we'll talk about the book quite a bit, and then we'll have tons of time for questions. And so we're hopeful that there'll be lots of uh, things that you might be curious about or might want to chat about that we can do some collective thinking around. So first things first, I'm going to share my screen and offer you a bit of a virtual tour of the archive space itself. Okay, so this is the archives, Canada's LGBTQ2 plus archives, and this is located in Toronto, Ontario. Um, this is the largest independent LGBTQ2 plus archive in the entire world. It's an archive that began in the early 1970s as a side project of the Canadian gay liberation newspaper, The Body Politics. So when this archive began, it was, it was simply a drawer in a filing cabinet that was used to hold materials that were used to produce the body politic. Since it was founded in about 1973, it's grown to be the largest independent LGBTQ2 plus archive in the entire world. And this is sort of phenomenal. This is something that I, I constantly reflect on about how lucky we are to have this so close um, and to have this material and this space available to us. So the archives is located just southeast of Young and Bloor in Toronto on Isabella Street. Um, this is one of three locations for the archives, but this is the main one. So if any of you ever go to do research at the archives, which you are certainly welcome to do, um, this is the location that you would go to. And I took, I went in and took just a few photographs um, of, of the space to give you an idea of the collection and the materials that Nisha and I spent years sort of just searching through and thinking about and holding in our hands to make sense of this book that we ended up publishing. So when you walk into the archives, you can see immediately that it is, it's sort of bursting with things. And again, this is just one of the three locations, but all of the locations are just jammed full of things. And what this archive collects is really anything related to LGBTQ2 plus communities, <clears throat> excuse me. Primarily the focus is on Canadian materials because this is the national Canadian uh, LGBTQ2 plus archive. 
<clears throat> but there's material from all over the world here and it just keeps growing and growing and growing. For example, when, I, when we went in to take these photographs, um, there were some materials left on the steps. And so when we went in, we picked up those materials. We don't know where they came from or who donated them, but we left them for the archivist to make sense of. I took a few photographs just to give you an idea of the space itself. This is the volunteer area. So this archive is almost entirely run by volunteers. There's about four or five staff members who, who make sure that everything works well, but the vast majority of the labor and the energy is done by volunteers. Um, and that's how it's been since it was founded in the early 1970s. The space itself is just full of materials. This is part of the library. If you look past the bookshelves, you can see map cab catalogs or map cabinets um, that look like this. These are all filled with posters and with uh, other forms of ephemera like flyers and maybe some oversized photographs and some artwork. So in each one of these drawers, we have a series of folders that are filled with posters from the past, things that are being kept and cared for in this space. There's also a, a pretty phenomenal photography collection. So this is part of the photograph collection. Again, in each one of these boxes, there are all of these folders that are filled with photographs, uh, like this one. This one is just described as four men with a cat. And I just thought that was sort of fun. Um, but in addition to photo printed photographs, we also have things like slides and negatives. Um, there's also just a great deal of uh, paper materials. And so these are called the vertical files. As you can see, they're organized by uh, in alphabetical order. These are the Canadian vertical files. And in each one of these boxes, again, there is a series of folders that carries material related to an individual, related to an event, related to an organization. Um, there's some folders in here related to McMaster and organizing that happened there or individuals who are part of the, the community of both McMaster and the broader LGBTQ2 plus community. Another map catalog, this one holds a lot of artwork, including artwork by Ronald McRae from the 1950s and 1960s. And Ronald McRae was, a, was a, worked for Vogue magazine in New York before coming back to Toronto, but these are all of his watercolor designs um, of outfits that he put together. So this is just a, a small sample of some of the things that are available in this space. If you do go into this archive as a researcher, this is the space that you'll hang out in and volunteers will bring you whatever materials you need. Um, you can see even this like research space is filled to the brim with things um, because this is just such a growing archive. This is what the basement looks like. This is what the majority of the building looks like, if I'm being honest with you, just tons and tons and tons of boxes that are organizing uh, a great deal of materials, paper materials, but also artifacts and objects. Um, this is just another shot of the same sort of space. We talk quite a bit in our book about pulp fiction because what we try and do in this book is trace a long history of LGBTQ2 plus uh, kinship and experience and activism in Canada. And so we try to draw from all different aspects of this collection. Um, so we really spent a lot of time digging through tons and tons and tons of material to try to make sense of the LGBTQ2 plus movement in Canada since about the mid, the 1930s is where we really start in this book. So these are just some LGBTQ2 plus board games. There's an entire section of the building that is just board games. And so that was just to give you an idea of the physical space itself um, and to give you a sense of the, the tons and tons and tons of materials that Nisha and I had to work through, I shouldn't say had to, that Nisha and I got to work through in order to produce this book out north. Nisha? Yeah, thanks, Craig. Um, that's a really helpful rundown. Um, I obviously haven't been into the archives <laughs> for a little bit of time, so it's nice to see, um, it's nice to remember what um, being inside a building like that is, is like. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about why we wanted to do the book and what um, our intention was behind it um, and things like that. So um, <clears throat> Craig had been volunteering at the archives for a few years um, and um, both of us sort of have like an attachment to archives as important places uh, for queer people, you know, um, especially if you sort of came of age just like before or just before um, the internet, uh, sort of, I think both Craig and I felt like archives were really important for um, feeling connected to uh, queer history, right? And like a queer, queer communities that came before. Um, so Craig was volunteering at the archives in Toronto and um, the opportunity came up to, to sort of do this book and to try and uh, bring 
bring what's special about queer history um, to a more general public. So we spent a lot of time uh, looking through everything and um, yeah, going through all the different uh, posters and letters and diaries and um, like personal effects and trying to put together a narrative uh, that we thought uh, was it was a good representation of what is in the archives, but also was um, a sort of interesting way about thinking about queer history in Canada. And um, yeah, so one of the things we tried to do is uh, try to be critical of our own framing of it. So in the preface, we have a section um, on uh, how we are trying to reckon with the fact that the that the book takes Canada as its overarching framework. And the book was coming out just as uh, the report um, in 2019 uh, on missing and murdered Indigenous women um, had also had also come out. And so we're, we try to reckon with um, the, the limitations of using Canada as a framework to think about queer history and also to try and reckon with um, the, the idea that queer history in Canada has like a linear march towards progress, right? So we're trying to both um, put together uh, uh, what seems like a sort of accurate representation of the archives and simultaneously be critical of a kind of progress narrative that um, absorbs some, some queer people uh, into, into the nation while sort of um, uh, refiguring other people out. So this, this is the sort of initial framing for the book. And from there, what we try and do is uh, as Craig is showing, is to try and, yeah, to try and give um, a lens into the archives history, the particular history that's in the archives. So um, we start with uh, what, how the archives itself was founded and then move on to some of its material from the Second World War and into the 70s and into the 80s and then um, into our more contemporary times. Um, so yeah, it was so much fun to work with. Certainly we had amazing publishers and it was also just really fun to work with this sort of uh, level of visual material. Um, and yeah, to get to, get to get to bring it to a, a broader audience, um, especially since like now in the, the time of COVID, um, actually going to archives and getting to spend time there uh, becomes less and less viable for many people. So I'm glad that this is out in the world. Yeah, and, and Misha, <clears throat> excuse me, you say um, one of the things that you just mentioned, I think is so important, right? Because there, <clears throat> I think there was an awareness among us and perhaps among other volunteers at the archives and other staff members at the archives of just how lucky we are to get to spend time working through this material um, and getting to, to sort of hold it and look through it and touch it and read it and all these things. And so, yeah, the one of the main, one certain impetus for this book was just trying to bring some of this history and some of these materials to broader audiences to, to, to try to make it a little bit more accessible. I mean, this book is about what, about 300 pages, um, full color, uh, thousands of reproductions um, that we try to contextualize with our writing to try to make sense of this, of this broader movement. Um, but Nisha, I was wondering, do you have, I, I was sort of thinking of fun things that we might want to talk about yeah. here today. Is there, is there something, do you have a favorite image in the book or do you have a favorite, is there something that, I mean, I know that's sort of hard to, to discuss or decide on, but is there something that you really enjoyed learning about or something that really was, you found quite moving when working on the book? Yeah, um, well, I think that this is probably true for Craig too, but one of um, my favorite stories in the book uh, is the story about the Van Dykes, which was oh, a group yes. of um, <laughs> like traveling le lesbian separatists in the 70s who made their way down from Toronto um, in a van um, and like picked up other lesbians along the way 
and drove through Mexico and then ended up founding um, a sort of lesbian separatist farm in BC. And so that's one of my favorite stories, partly because it's, um, it's just like a sort of fascinating story. There's been some work on it done in the New Yorker, um, but also because in the archives, Craig and I found um, the diary of a founding member and uh, her name is Anne Spaulding. And it was really just like an amazing experience to, um, yeah, to just like, read what her experiences were like as sort of a young lesbian at the time, but also to see in writing her records of her own dreams, you know, um, and mm -hmm. the desire for a kind of lesbian utopia. Um, and one of the things Craig and I were really hoping to do with the book is to try and think through um, like the absences in the archives, right? And to like um, the history that uh, we most often have access to around queerness and also in the archives tends to be like uh, focused on like white gay male history. And so we were really interested in not just, um, it, it, we were really interested in trying to find the exceptions to that in the archives and trying to, uh, make links between um, like the struggles that are kind of most often talked about uh, with those that aren't and to see to try and find in the absences a kind of like kinship and solidarity uh, between people of different races and different sexualities and genders um, so to try and find that even in the absences you know to really like try and look for the links and the Van Dykes I think were really amazing way of doing that because when we read her diary her diary we could really see that the questions about like feminism and racism um, and sort of queer liberation but also women's liberation um, was they were alive at the time in a really big way too and uh, that was that was just kind of amazing to see. That's, yeah, that's such a good sort of description of the process and the sort of joy that I think we have found from working through this material. Um, one thing that it also made me think of is, is the fact that when we found this material, including Ange Spaulding's diary, which I think we were both really moved by, like emotionally struck by getting to read her thinking and it, as she was going through this journey, we, we also reached out to other members of the Van Dykes who are still living. So Ange passed away, unfortunately, but there are other members of the Van Dykes who are still living and we just sort of cold called them, right? We just emailed Lamar Van Dyke and we said, you know, we're trying to make sense of this diary and this moment um, in history for this book. Can you give us some advice or can you help us understand it? And of course, she wrote back, immediately and offered her memories, offered some more photographs. And it was just such a beautiful moment. I mean, I think it, uh, including kinship in the title, I think Nisha comes from your work more broadly, a lot of your work on friendship and kinship and these sorts of things. But that was this moment where it all of a sudden fell into place for me or really made sense to me because not only do we feel, not only have we developed a sense of kinship or closeness or collectivity with the people that we talked about in this book, but also they are still connecting us with others in the way that Ange posthumously connected us with Lamar and helped us understand this history uh, in a more sort of capacious, in a more capacious way, I suppose. Yeah. yeah, so I'm just sort of scrolling through a little bit, some of the pages, just to give you an idea of um, the sheer number of reproduction of, of images and the amount of text that tries to contextualize it. Um, Are there favorite images you have, Craig? Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, I think maybe the one, you know what, I'm going to scroll to the one that I think is maybe my, my favorite image in the book. Um, sorry, it's a bit, it's a big book, so it takes a while <laughs> to find these. Um, yeah, so this image. So this image on page 195 um, is an image of a woman named Eva Helpert um, holding the sign and she's standing there next to her father, um, Elmer. And so they're protesting in 1988, I think. Um, they're protesting at a pharmaceutical company on Bay Street in Toronto. Um, basically Eva Helpert's child uh, had HIV AIDS. 
um, and Bristol Myers, which was the pharmaceutical, comp pharmaceutical company, was withholding a drug that could potentially have, have saved his life. Um, and so Eva, Eve Helpert and uh, her father, Elmer, were there every day protesting this pharmaceutical company um, for about four or five months in the summer. Um, and it's just, I don't know, it's just obviously like a heartbreaking photo in so many ways, but it's also so beautiful that this this woman and her dad, so the grandfather and the mother of this man who was diagnosed with HIV AIDS, um, were on Bay Street in downtown Toronto in the sort of downtown core, the business and financial core, and just standing there every day making their presence known and trying to tell this story. And so that's that's an image that has uh, stuck with me for a, for a long time. Um, I think Nisha and I were both really moved by all of the work on, on AIDS organizing in the 1980s and, and AIDS activism um, that, mm -hmm. that we got to witness by working through this material. Yeah. 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 Um, one of the questions we get a lot in in sort of the chats we've been doing about the book has been about what we think the what the relevance of sort of going back to queer time like uh, queer history is to the present mm -hmm. and particularly um, what we think the process of going back to a queer history to contemporary struggles um, against homophobia but also uh, racism and colonialism is. So I don't know, Craig, if you have any thoughts on that or I can speak to it too. Why don't you get started and then I'll, and then yeah. I'll join you. How about that? Yeah, uh, one of the things that Craig and I are really interested in is um, to try and think about what kind of solidarity or coalition building uh, was possible um, earlier in the sort of like times that this book documents um, that might get erased uh, or not be so visible to us now. And so um, like uh, Craig's work, I know is a lot about uh, like about uh, solidarity around like times the bathhouse raids and um, yeah, we were just like really interested, I think, to see where uh, queer people or like what was seen as like queer struggle like and um, by default sort of white male queer struggle really uh, co converged with um, anti-racist and anti-colonial and feminist struggles. So that was, yeah, that was like one of the reasons I think we feel like going back to a queer history is important for like contemporary life um, because we as people living now and with mostly only access to what's happening now um, might have things to learn from the coalition building of the past. So. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic answer. So I'm not sure if I have, <clears throat> excuse me, much more to, to offer, but I think, yeah, I think we're both really interested in thinking about what we still can learn from the past, right? And this, yeah. the way that the past continues to hold so much promise for us and so much knowledge and pot potential and <clears throat> and I guess one thing that really became clear to me as we were working on this book is just the fact that um, <clears throat> yeah there's still so much to learn from the past and we don't have to reinvent the wheel in contemporary activism like there's still um, so much that we can learn from people who have thought about similar things and obviously the context right the historical and cultural moment in which we are doing contemporary activism is is radically different than than earlier forms um, or earlier moments, but there's still so much to be to be learned from and to and to build on from those from those past moments. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the really interesting things for me, um, like going back to some of this like older material, um, was the kind of campiness of some of it. So I was like really excited to see the sections on, or sorry, just to see the archives holding on like lesbian pulp fiction um, and things like that. And like it's such an interesting thing to witness as like some central aspects of queer culture are getting kind of worn down in the present. So to just see like at the same time as there are like no, like very few, lesbian bars these days to just see like all these um, really colorful, overtly sexual kind of campy um, lesbian pulp fiction novels. This is like a really interesting juxtaposition. 
Um, so it was also cool on that level or like maybe queer history is helpful on that level to just, um, just to remember that there were like forms of representation or campiness or sex sexuality that aren't so available at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah absolutely. Um, so it's, I wonder if we, Nisha, do, should yeah. we hinge to some questions? Yeah, I think so. There are quite a few. Uh, okay. Um, so we have a few that were submitted before and then also on here. So I'll just read out the ones we've gotten most recently. So uh, are there ever, are there efforts to digitize the collection? Um, Craig, you could probably speak to that. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is a great question, right? This is, I think, one of the defining or driving questions about archival collections in our current moment. Um, perhaps perhaps especially during a pandemic, right? When we're, when we're not able to physically visit or physically go to these archival collections, can we still access the materials? So the archives has done, um, the staff members in particular have really pushed for digitization of a lot of materials. And if you go to the website, which is just arquives.ca, um, so it's like, it's spelled archives, but it is, we're told it's supposed to be pronounced archives. Um, but if you go to that website, you can search the collection and you can see some of the digitized material. And there's also volunteers who have worked on putting together exhibits of digital, digital materials um, on the archives website, um, which is a really nice way to, to get a sense of some of the things that are available in the collection. Um, but this is such a good question because Nisha and I have been thinking a lot. So one of the things that we try to work through in the book is that the archives in Toronto is the largest LGBTQ2 plus archive that is independent uh, in the entire world. But it's one of just many, many amazing queer and trans and two-spirit archives in Canada, right? So there's a, um, there's a trans archive out in BC. There's a two-spirit archive in Manitoba. Um, there are archival projects in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick and PEI, all related to LGBTQ2 plus history. Um, there are, of course, other collections in some of the major urban spaces in the, in the nation um, and in small towns, right? And so the question about digitization makes me think about the importance of, of creating a network of all of these different archives, right? And I think that that digitization will be the, the way to do that because, I mean, there's obviously an incredible amount of material at this archive in Toronto, but it's really, I mean, Oat North scratches the surface of this collection, which is huge, but the collection itself is just one part of a larger puzzle of archival collections in Canada that have um, specific ties to specific groups or specific collectives within the LGBTQ2 plus community. Um, and so, yes, this is a very long-winded answer to, to the question. Yes, there are efforts to digitize the collection that are ongoing. And Nisha and I are very hopeful that there is even greater efforts moving forward because um, we think that that's probably the most productive and generative way to connect all of these disparate um, or diverse archival projects. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that sort of maybe hinges to the, the a related question, which is whether there are plans to get a larger space to accommodate all the material. Um, I mean, the archives has like a few locations, some of it, which is mostly storage. So I don't know if there are plans to, to expand. I think just based on things that I have heard, I think there are always plans to expand. Um, and I think there's also a, a desire to expand in a way that allows for more public access to the collection. So I don't know if that means expanding so that it becomes an archive and a museum or builds up its gallery space um, or, yeah. or some other sort of approach. But, but it seems to me that there's always plans to expand. <laughs> plans to expand. But Nisha, you're right that like, there's, there's multiple locations and most of them are simply storage. Mm -hmm. Some of them are just sort of like a, a huge factory, a huge warehouse of, of stored materials. Um, yeah. And so I, I am glad that that came up because I think it's worth mentioning that when we sort of get through this cultural moment um, that we're currently trying to navigate, I hope that people go to do research at these archives, but I hope that people keep in mind that it's important that you contact the archive in advance because the material that you want might not be at this one location just because there is so much material that so much of it is, is, is stored in, in offsite um, storage. Yeah. 
Misha, maybe we can hinge to the next question, which is about the publisher. So do you yeah. want to talk a little bit about our experience working with figure one? Um, and we can talk about how we how we chose it. And, and I like this question. So it says, can you talk about your goals in publishing this as a trade book as opposed to a more narrowly focused peer reviewed academic book from a scholarly press? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so figure one is a publisher in Vancouver. Um, and they do like really beautiful visual books or like part of part of the books they do they're so compelling because the visual element is is really amazing um so we yeah so that was part of the reason we went with them also because they're just the process of working with them was really was really exceptional like their editorial process and uh the the design like it was we felt i think very both involved in the process but also that we were in good hands um, and I think part of the reason, like the, the fact that their visual work was so compelling is because we really, we didn't want it to be like a very, um, a very specific specialized academic book. I think we wanted it to reach as many people as possible. Um, and yeah, also to, to just give a broad, for people to be able to participate in our attempt to to write a broad a broad narrative a broad history about um, queer activism and kinship in Canada, which um, is is difficult, I think, to do in academic work that needs to be like highly focused and also quite uh, quite exclusive in its own way. So I think we both had a political and an aesthetic commitment to not doing that. And, it, and it's so interesting because I think, I, I mean, knowing a bit about both of our scholarly work, Nisha, I think that the type of work we tend to do is like very sort of focused, right? And maybe that's true of academic work more broadly. Like we're, we tend to home in on, on one specific text or one specific line from a text, right? And try to sort of make sense of that. Whereas this was a very different project in the sense that we were trying to offer this like very broad overview of a huge amount of time, right? Eras and eras of time and a huge sort of in, in over broad geographical space, right? So it was like, it was also a real challenge, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy that we did it the way that we did. It's, mm -hmm. it's funny because I think the thing that I love most about the book is the design, which is funny because we did not do that, right? We had this, <laughs> we had this amazing designer, Jess Sullivan, um, who did this work, who just does the most phenomenal work um, alongside our editor, Michelle Mead, both of whom have a lot of experience writing for broad audiences. So that was really nice for us as individuals who, well, Nisha, a lot of your work is for broader audiences as well, but, but we certainly have experience writing for specific audiences. Um, yeah. And so it was nice to have that guidance from figure one. I think mm -hmm. we originally went with figure one. Um, basically, we, we went to type books on Queen and looked through some of the books and some of the most beautiful ones there of this style were, were published by figure one. And then, so that's why we reached out to them. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, the next question is, does the archive actively seek out material that can fill in the voids in the collection? Yeah, I think that it is doing that. And it's, it's sort of, there's been a lot of community feedback. Um, yeah, compelling the archives to do that and saying that it's a sort of extremely important project of queer history to fill in the absences so that there's more acknowledgement and material of um, the, like the, the queer historical work of Black Indigenous. Um, and people of color uh, and also uh, trans, trans people and uh, women. So I think that is something that the archives is actively doing. Uh, I know Craig and I are sort of, I think that's a really important project, but as Craig mentioned, there are also other archives in, the, uh, other archives in Canada that are already doing that work. So I think it's a sort of interesting question if like, it's good for those, for materials to be diffuse and in different places, or if they should all be held within one archive, um, or if that like adds to the problem itself. So I think that's a sort of ongoing question that archivists um, are working out. Yeah, and, and I think there have certainly been, 
I guess we could call them growing pains with this particular archive in the sense that when it began, um, and even for decades afterwards, I think the main impulse um, was not about going out and collecting material, but was about taking material that was donated and just trying to care for it and curate it. But, but I think in more contemporary moments, we've realized that, oh, that, there might, that might be a way that the archive is lacking, right? Because as we said periodically throughout this, this talk, um, there is such a high volume of material related to like white, gay, cis men in urban spaces um, and those sort of like traditional forms of activism that have to do with like the judicial sphere or the legislative sphere um, <clears throat> or on the street activism, all of which is of course important to this history, but is certainly not the only aspect of this history worth remembering and archiving and caring for and, and chronicling. And so I think, yeah, there's more of an intention now to go out and find material because there are, um, there are limitations. I, I mean, I think every archive has a specific frame and has limitations, um, but there are things that I think need to be worked through and there's more and more awareness of that. You know, if this, if we, if this archive wants to claim to be a community archive, then it needs to talk to more than, or it needs to uh, evidence the experiences of more than one, just like very specific part of that community. Yeah. Um, Misha, maybe, we, can I maybe ask you some of the questions yeah. that we got a little bit earlier? Totally. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I know that, well, maybe maybe I'll, I'll ask the one, there's a question here about how the archive is used by community members and by mm -hmm. academic researchers. Um, okay. So do you want to talk about that? But I also wonder if you want to talk a bit about your experience in archives, because I mean, you've spent time in the Lesbian Her Story archive in New York, right? Like you've yeah. done archival work in other archives and maybe you can just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, um, I've spent a little bit of time at the Lesbian History Archives. Um, I've spent um, a bit more time at the British Library and some of the colonial archives they have there. Um, and yeah, it's just always a really interesting experience. You know, I think that um, partly it's really intellectually compelling because um, especially when I was at the Lesbian History Archives, it was just like, so amazing to like hold people's writing or their stuff um, in in my hands, but I think yeah, like it's just like a, a really intellectually interesting experience. But I think also just an emotional one. Like I think to um, anything that kind of feels like it binds us to people who we, we don't know, but we like feel are somehow related or um, connected to us is really, is really exciting. So I certainly felt that in the, the lesbian history archives in New York, but even some of the sort of more traditional um, like archives like, that are held in the British library, um, just feeling like to be to be witnessing or like having access to history is is amazing you know it's really lucky so I think that lots of people certainly academics lots of academics use the archives in Toronto um, and the archivists there uh, are really helpful for that um, I, I get the sense that the community uses of the space are not just related to people coming um, into research material, but um, that there are like art shows and exhibitions and um, community nights. And I, I think they're working to expand those um, or adapt them to COVID times. Um, but it seems on a community level, it's both the material that's really important, but also the space as like a sort of community space. Um, and I know that there have been like lots of efforts to make that more accessible to um, sort of people of color and women and trans communities. Yeah, and in, in the, the archive tour that we opened this talk with, um, I didn't include photos of all of the spaces, but there is um, a really nice gallery space that mm -hmm. you're right, hosts really important events uh, and exhibitions. <clears throat> of course, it's not doing that right now. So it's sort of been 
taken over by archivists as working space because under the pandemic and the lockdown, nobody is actually permitted to go there, right? It's not open to the public at this point. Um, but I do hope that in the future, maybe people will keep an eye out for events that are going on there. It's just a quick, quick uh, go bus ride in from Hamilton, if that's where some of our participants are, are joining us from, from today. Um, yeah, it's, it's funny, your mention of, of sort of holding materials and feeling a connection to people just sort of recalled for me the fact that we dedicated this book to three people we have never met, yeah. um, but, it's, but it's three people whose materials we were working through when we were working on this book and, and whose lives we got a sense of by virtue of working through those materials, right? And, and so it did, there is something about the materiality of, this, of these historical documents where we're holding them in your hand and, and and working through them in a physical tactile way is a really beautiful and, and meaningful sort of bonding experience or connecting experience um, with so many others. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, <laughs> some of the other questions is, where is the gay community since the diaspora into mainstream society? Um, yeah, I think a sort of interesting question about like what, happens to gay life and a sort of sense of community as uh, things as like queerness becomes more and more mainstream and gets uh, sort of yeah uh, recognized by the state uh, that is one of the questions I think we tried to tackle in the book just to just to ask like what kind of politics are possible when um yeah, when things become legal, right? And um, since gay marriage, uh, so I don't, I don't know if I can answer that about like where is the community, but um, maybe Craig, you. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think this question gets at the core of one of the sort of major, I don't know, maybe not tensions, but yeah, sort of questions about contemporary queerness and, and what that means as things are becoming uh, more mainstream. Um, and so I wonder, I guess, as we're thinking about this question, I'm wondering if that's part of our pull or part of our desire to participate in the past, because it's just, it seems more, I don't know, it seems so different to think about queer communities in the past than it does to think about contemporary queer communities. And that's not to suggest that I don't know. I, I, this, I'm not trying to make all sorts of assumptions about either the past or about the present, but I'm just thinking about how um, there are moments in this past where it seemed like there was a more easily defined notion of collective agency, maybe, and collective power and, and collective care um, in a way that I think binded people together in different ways than we may be bound now. Yeah. If that makes sense. That seems true. I think especially since like, certainly since COVID, but even before that, since like so much of queer life happens now on the internet and um, like generations sort of split more quickly, I think based on um, like, based on what kind of social media you're using. So there's a whole like queer life on Snapchat that, you know, just people who are a few years older might not have. And so, or TikTok, maybe Snapchat yeah. is an older one, I don't know. Um, but yeah, so I, I don't know where there is like a sort of coherent queer community at the moment. Um, and I think that's good and bad, right? I think at some point, it, like in some way, it must mean that people have more options and can come out when they're younger and um, be safer. And at the same time, it's difficult, I think not to have an intergenerational community um, that's like you can be physically present with. And so, yeah, that's my interpretation of that question. Um, but if we've understood I, it wrong. I, no, I, think, know. I think that what you just said was also quite important, right? Like this desire for an intergenerational sense of queer collectivity mm -hmm. is increasingly difficult when we're sort of um, dispersed among a variety of uh, networks, I guess, like whether that's sort of virtual networks or, or even sort of physical, more, more tangible networks. Like it's mm -hmm. because we so seldom come together, or I shouldn't say we so seldom, but because we come together in physical space in such profoundly different ways than 
people did in the past that we trace mm. in this in this book it's it's there's a challenge in sort of locating and recognizing and understanding the community and our place within it right um, yeah oh sorry no, no no I was just uh yeah, I was just thinking that I missed the queer dance party and yeah. <laughs> look forward to that coming back at one point. Yeah, it's amazing how, I mean, there's all sorts of reasons, right? Why what we're currently living through is horrific and just mm. so draining and crushing. Um, but yeah, it seems like there are fewer and fewer opportunities for any sort of collective joy or collective mm-hmm. bliss that mm-hmm. sustains us or has the potential to sustain us through periods like this and and I don't know the pandemic has just sort of made that impossible in ways that are are so gutting and so so horrible um just a few more questions I see we're getting close to close to time but um there's one question is there a verification process to um verify anonymously donated materials um it's a great question yes so a lot of materials gets donated to the archives from individuals or from community groups or organizations, right, that have some sort of connection to LGBTQ2 plus culture uh, in Canada mostly, but some material does just get dropped off anonymously. And I think we see this um, particularly when maybe um, an older LGBTQ2 plus person passes away and the people who are left um, with their materials don't really know what to do with it. And so I think often we get a lot of material um, donated because of that. Um, but the staff members and the volunteers, some of the volunteers have been uh, volunteering since the late 70s. Um, I'm thinking about Alan here in particular, a very long time volunteer, um, who do this sort of detective work to try to verify as much as they can from any piece of material that's donated. And that's one of the really wonderful things, I think, about having such a vast network or vast community of volunteers um, from all different generations and from just from so many different backgrounds who, who can help sort of do this, this uh, investigative work to try to make sense of the materials that are being brought into the collection. And they all work under the, the guidance of the executive director, Reagan Swanson and the archivist, uh, Lucy, who, who really sort of provides the guidance to doing this type of verification work. Um, yeah. Misha, the, there's two more questions and they seem to be related. So maybe we can wrap them into, into yeah. one. Um, and maybe this, will, it looks like this is the last question. So we can, we can work through this as a concluding gesture. But the questions are, you know, how do you think the digital lifestyles that we're so embedded yeah. in now are impacting social movements and queer life? And then the second question I think is related to this in a really mm-hmm. interesting way. How do archival efforts take place now that so much of our experience with others is online and is yeah. in digital space, right? Where there's not that sort of material um, evidence of, of things happening. Yeah, I, those are great questions. Great um, questions. <laughs> Very difficult questions, I think, but really uh, amazing questions. Yeah, a couple of weeks ago, um, Craig and I did a podcast called the Thinking Queerly podcast and that was the big question that um, we were asked and we tried to work through uh, with the with the host um, it which is just like yeah what do we do now that so much of queer life seems to be on Twitter or on social media or <laughs> on Facebook um, and like social media has been important in giving birth to a whole set of new terms, you know, for um, that relate to like sexuality and queer identity and gender. Um, So I don't, I don't know. I think it means that much gets lost because like the pace at which things are being produced um, is so fast. Um, Like, things have a lifespan online um, that is much different to things that are material, right? And um, so I don't know, I think one of the kind of compelling things for me and Craig working in the archives was that I think we came of age just as the internet was happening and which really accelerated, I think, a lot of my own experience of being queer, but also felt like a big shift Um, and so I think to hold things in the archives like matchbooks or people's business cards or buttons or like these kinds of things the ways that 
people like signal to each other in the past that they were queer or that they were politically aligned. Um, it felt really ama- it felt really amazing, which is like different than how we sort of signal to each other that we're politically aligned on Twitter or something like that. So I don't I don't know how that's going to be digitized. I think that or so how that will be archived. I think that some of that might get lost um, in the process. It's, it's funny that you mentioned matchbooks, Nisha, because I was thinking about the same sort of thing. I remember when we were digging through the collection, <laughs> looking for materials for this book, we found, I mean, one of the things that this archive specializes in collecting is matchbooks, because a lot of other archives don't collect this. And for a long time, matchbooks were the primary way of advertising a gay organization or a mm-hmm. queer business or an LGBTQ community center. Um, and we found matchbooks that had, you know, notes written in them, right? Or phone numbers written in pen on them. Um, And I just think about that in terms of like cruising and connecting with people in public spaces um, because there is the sort of material evidence of this experience and this relation that doesn't exist in the same way if it's being done on Grindr or Bumble or Tinder or these sorts of digital spaces, right? And so I think maybe it's also potentially a call to action to those of us who are committed to LGBTQ2 plus politics and activism and culture is to think about ways that we might want to archive these experiences in our lives and go through the effort of of putting them into a collection like the archives or finding a way to ensure that these are kept and held onto and, and can provide evidence for future generations of researchers and queers who are trying to make sense of, of the past. Mm-hmm. Great. Um, maybe just to, we'll, we'll pass it back to Chris, but maybe um, just to wrap up, we forgot to mention that the afterword in the book is written by two McMaster crew members as well. Um, Amber Dean, who's a professor of English and cultural studies and gender studies and feminist research at McMaster right now, wrote the afterword with um, Fanwell Antwi, who's a professor at UBC, but did his PhD in English and cultural studies at McMaster. And so it was a really um, sort of wonderful experience working working with them. Thank you so much for joining and asking all these questions. Yeah, these were fantastic questions. and thanks to Chris for organizing and Dave to, for making sure that all the tech stuff worked. It's yeah. been a lot of fun. Well, thank you, uh, both of you, for your, your time today and for bringing, well, for that peek into the archives and for the peek into that beautiful book that you've published. I mean, what a wonderful uh, thing to have and hold uh, for you two. Um, And thank you to our audience for joining us. We're very grateful for your interest in our events. Um, When this webinar ends, you'll see a survey pop up and I do hope you'll take a few minutes to leave your thoughts for us. We really appreciate and um, we really look at all the feedback we get. Uh, So thanks again, Craig and Nisha uh, for joining us today and uh, everyone have a great day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye.